Hi everyone, and welcome to today's session uh, for the British Science Week, where we are going to talk about the genetics of nationalism and consumerism. So at the first, we'll introduce ourselves. So my name is Kostu Adhikari. I'm a lecturer in statistics at the Open University, and my research work is primarily in statistical genetics. So I work in studying uh, the genetics of human diversity and the genetics of human appearance. In this regard, I have uh, done a lot of public engagement work, some of which, for example, have been covered by BBC. And uh, in addition, I have also been trying to raise awareness about some of the misunderstandings around the public use of genetics. And therefore, uh, we will discuss some of these issues in the presentation today. Hi, I'm Shomo. I am a PhD student in statistics at the Open University. I do my research on the application of statistics on genetics. Previously, I used to be a data scientist and uh, used to work on statistical modeling in various financial institutions. Thank you, Shomo. So we are going to turn our videos off now uh, for a better viewing of the presentation. And at the end, we will have questions that uh, you can send us to the Facebook or YouTube chat. And when we discuss those, then we'll turn our videos back on again. Okay, so moving on, we are going to start by understanding our heritage. And probably the best icebreaker is to just know a bit about ourselves. As you probably have seen in the video, I'm of South Asian ethnicity. Um, I'm Indian, or more specifically Bengali. And the same is true for Shomo as well. Uh, so please uh, go to this Desmos link, which is where we will have a lot of interactive questions throughout this session. So the link should also be given in the uh, chat or YouTube description. Uh, so please go to this link where we will be asking you several questions during the session and you will be able to respond back to us and we'll be able to see your answers as live. So uh, please go to this link in Desmos and let us know what you consider your ethnicity to be. So we'll uh, wait for a little while for the responses to start coming in and then Shomo can let us know what the responses look like. And I'm hoping that this being the British Science Week, probably we are going to get a lot of British participants, but also the UK being a place of very diverse ethnicity probably a lot of people from different ethnicities as well. And of course, if the ones that are listed uh, does not match the ethnicity that you consider yourself, then please select other. Have we started to get some answers, Shomo? Yes, we are starting to see some responses. So as of now, I have seen only one response in white British segment and the other is in the other section. Okay, maybe let's wait for a little while longer. But other participants have been making. So now more responses are coming in. Wonderful. And what do people say? Uh, I've got a couple of white British and then one white Irish. And there was one other response in white other European segment as well. Okay. It's nice to get a mix of different ethnicities in the audience because uh, there will be a lot of different issues that we are discussing that parting to different ethnicities. So I think that will be interesting to see how our audience reflects or connects to these different questions depending on the ethnicity. So we can probably move on now and go to the next segment, which uh, is a, a clip from uh, this British TV series called Black Hatter. And I think this is relevant because this is really a question about who is British. And if you haven't seen this already, it's already a funny comedy series. Uh, so here, Black Hatter, uh, Ron Atkinson, is seen interrogating someone during the First World War who is suspected of being a German spy. So let's see. Look, I'm as British as Queen Victoria! So your father's German, you're half German, and you married a German. <laughs> so 
This is funny because if you think about uh, the royal British royal family, that's probably like the epitome of Britishness. But as you can see here, uh, they are reminding the viewers about the German connection. And that's probably something to think about uh, when we talk about ethnicity and the various aspects in which people define or identify ethnicity. Oh, uh, okay, so that brings us to the next question of what does it mean to uh, have ancestors? Uh, how do we define ancestors? Because a lot of time we talk about ethnicity from the perspective of ancestry. So uh, just to remind ourselves, we all inherit our genes from our ancestors. And as you can see in this diagram, if you go back upwards uh, in the family tree, you have two parents, uh, you have four grandparents, I'm talking here about biological parents, and so on. Uh, and all of these ancestors have contributed their genes to us. So the more we go back in time, the more ancestors we have, but also uh, all of these ancestors are contributing their genes to us. So the amount of contribution that we get from any specific ancestor decreases because, for example, one of our parents are, is giving us only half of the genome, but the grandparents are giving us only a quarter. And you can see as we go back very quickly, the contribution from any specific ancestor decreases. And by the time we reach seven generations, their contribution is less than 1%. So, and uh, at the same time, we have more than 100 uh, ancestors the seventh generation. So that's really uh, something that uh, we don't think often, that as we go back, uh, the probability or the chance of inheriting no DNA from a specific ancestor very quickly reaches almost 100%. In other words, we may not inherit any gene uh, from one specific ancestor, in this case, uh, about 14 generations back. And that's really not that long time, just a few hundred years. So that's really uh, something to think about because if we go back to K generations, we had two to the power K ancestors, and that is an exponential growth. You may remember talking about exponential growth during the COVID spread models. So with an average generation time of 25 to 30 years, if we go back 500 years, we had a million ancestors. And if we went back a thousand years, we would have had more than a trillion ancestors. And that's really more than the number of people ever lived, especially back in those times. So how is that possible? And that's possible uh, if we remember that we all share ancestors and in, in several different ways. So for example, you and your cousin share a grandparent. That's why that person is your cousin. But also in most population groups, uh, especially say in smaller places like villages, there was inbreeding to a certain extent, which means that people are intermarrying within that location and sharing more pains. So considering all of these, it's really no surprise that we do not have that many distinct ancestors in the past. And the number of ancestors we really had does not really increase exponentially, but it actually decreases because in the past, the population sizes were smaller. So uh, that then brings us to this question that we often see in TV series is that people talk about links to royal families. Uh, remember a few years back, someone did a TV program in which they did a bit of genetic testing and said that, oh, I have probably descended from uh, King Edward III, or sometimes people use genealogical trees to establish these kind of claims. So just for curiosity, do any of you know of any royal or noble heritage in your family? Uh, please let us know at the Desmos polls. If you click next on the poll, that should bring you to the second part of the poll and you can let us know if you know of anything. And even if you're not sure, but you have heard something, that's still fine, please let us know. So we are already seeing responses uh, on this question and uh, mm -hmm. apparently none of the uh, students here have any royal or noble heritage in their families. Okay, thank you, Shomo. Yeah, I mean, most of us probably don't know about such connections. I don't, of course, uh, and that's fine. Uh, it's actually interesting to know that given the previous facts that a lot of us share ancestors and the more we go back in time, the more ancestors we shared with each other. Uh, calculations show that any British person has more than 99% chance of having King Edward III as one of their ancestors or historical ancestors such as William the Conqueror. But at the same time, the probability that you inherit 
any DNA from them is very like uh, low. So it's very likely that even if the person has these king's sister and sisters, they don't inherit any DNA from them. And these statements may appear contradictory, but that's really the oddity of mathematics. Uh, so let's talk a bit more about ethnic growth because we, at the beginning, were asking what's your ethnicity. And in this context, it's very important to remember that scientists don't use the word race anymore. And that's because it carries a huge baggage of misconceptions and misuse. So the term ethnicity or ethnic group is often used and can mean many different things. It can mean continental ethnic groups like European or subcontinental, such as British, or even regional, such as say Scottish. And we tend to think ethnicities as distinct, discrete genetic groups, but that's not really the case. So for example, someone may be mixed ethnicity and say can be 50% British and 50% African and so on. And it's also important to remember that humans are really stagnant and isolated to stay in groups. We always flow, spread and mix. So that genetic continuity means that our genetic landscapes actually form the gradients shaped by geological features. And we can illustrate this nicely with the analogy of a color palette. So uh, let's look at this color palette uh, on our screen and you would have that on the Desmos link as well. So please go to the Desmos page and add or write some names onto the colors that you see. So for example, you can write in the lower right corner red because that's red in that corner or blue in the lower left corner and so on. So please write down some color names that you see and let's see what you are responding. So the, um, the responses are coming in, right, as we say. Um, and I would say that there are, you know, there is wide diversity among the responses. Like some mm -hmm. of the students are just writing down the standard colors, the basic colors, while some of the students are going into finer, uh, finer granularities, like let's say a lime green between green and yellow. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, it's indeed something that uh, we can have a lot of variability and a lot of subjectivity. But this is also something interesting to consider because we probably don't think of colors in our daily lives as a gradient. We think of them as distinct names assigned to a specific color, but it's interesting to think about it as a gradient and see how it changes our perception. So uh, the, the question that Shoku was discussing is how many color names did our participants use? And did they only use the primary colors, red, green, blue? Did they also use secondary colors like magenta or cyan? Or did they use more common color names like orange and so on? But at the same time, there's also another question that if we want to part uh, split this color palette into uh, different labels, then we have to think about what exactly is red. And red is not just one point in this color palette, it's a region. So can you mark the region in the color palette that you would call red? And uh, in addition, can you actually divide the entire color palette into named regions? So can you draw lines or boundaries on the color palette in Desmos and split the color palette into different regions where each region corresponds to one color name. So let's see how you do that. And while doing it, if you think that it actually needs more categories to be more precise, then that's fine as well. So we are still waiting for the responses. Okay. Well, of course, the responses have started coming in. And the interesting thing to note here is uh, there was a, a major agreement among the standard colors. While there was major agreement among the standard colors, there seems to be you know, uh, different opinions among people about where should be the boundaries of these colors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually exactly what we expect to see, that color names are fine, but there's a lot of subjectivity in, uh, well, we try to be precise. And that's really the challenge that uh, to assign labels, you have to draw boundaries and cut it into groups. And where exactly do you draw the boundaries? So it, because it's quite ambiguous, sometimes you may think that, okay, when I'm splitting yellow and green actually makes more sense, 
to add a category called lime green, as Shomo was mentioning. And that's actually quite subjective. So this is, for example, what I had drawn. And this is, for example, what someone else had done. And you can see the boundaries are really different. And that really reflects our subjective function. And that's exactly what's happening with genetics or in general human variability as well, that we don't really think about the continuum of people, the geographic continuity across the continents. Uh, but if we use the same analogy, then that helps us uh, recognize things in a different way. So for example, a big genetics project called the Thousand Genomes Project started to understand human variability by sampling some population groups from three different parts of the world, from West Europe, Central Africa, and East Asia. And if you look at, at the people in these three different places, they are easy to separate in genetic data, and they're also quite distinct in appearance. And that's how exactly early explorers or anthropologists, upon seeing people from faraway lands, thought that these people are very distinct to themselves and call them distinct races. But as we saw that we actually represent gradients of genes and appearances. So uh, another example of this continuum would be um, skin color. So let's look at these two people below, uh, one on the far left and one on the far right. Uh, you may call the person on the left to be fair skinned and you might call the person on the right to be dark skin. And that's probably something that most people would agree with as a, a binary or two category classification. But what about if we had another people in the middle, but we stuck with the same two groups that we had defined earlier, fair skin and dark skin, where would you put this person? Would you call this person fair skin or dark skin? Please let us know at the Desmos link and we'll see what you, choose to categorize this person. So well, we are starting to see responses in the Desmos. Uh, uh, till now, the responses have been divided equally among uh, fair skin and dark skin. That's interesting. And that probably makes sense given that uh, this person is somewhere in the middle, so not fully dark, but not fully fair skin either. And that's something that people have uh, thought about previously as well, that if they only knew people from two distinct categories and then they see people in the intermediate categories or in between the gradient, then their uh, common thoughts about uh, binary categories are usually challenged. And th that would be even more challenged if we then looked at the entire continuum, which would then look like this. And then what can we do about uh, this situation in this gradient of skin color all the way from light to dark? Does it still make sense to stick with the binary grouping? And if we did that, then we would probably draw a boundary somewhere in the middle and call people on the left uh, fair skin and call people in the right dark skin. However, if you draw a boundary in the middle, then the two people on each side of the boundary are probably going to look quite similar in terms of skin color, yet they would be assigned to completely different categories because we, are, we have tied our hands in trying to impose a binary categorization. And that's sort of the message I try to convey that whenever you think about people, don't think about binary categories, but think of a continuum where we all are mixed and we all have uh, various degrees of characteristics. Uh, so let's bring that a bit forward. We were talking about ethnic groups so far, and let's see how ethnic groups are being talked about in ancestry tests. So you may see uh, genetic ancestry tests giving us reports about people's uh, locations. And just as we may group people, uh, sorry, just as we may group colors into red, green, blue primary colors, uh, we may try to group people into continents, for example, European, Africa, and so on. And ancestry testing companies usually do that because it's simple to interpret. But at the same time, they may also try to get a bit more fine scale and just like giving secondary colors like yellow or magenta, they might also give you some subcontinent groups. So in this example, they're telling about British Isles or Iberia or Southern Europe and so on. So when we do that, uh, as I said, separating major colors is easy. 
and it's the same for skin color or for ethnicity. So for example, if you look at the top picture on the right, uh, if you look at the two extremes, which is what the Thousand Genomes Project started with, it's relatively easy to separate them genetically or in terms of appearance. And we also tend to think of the two extremes of the gradient as the representative set of people for that categorization. So people of West Europe may be considered as the most typical European. Uh, however, if you look at the picture at the bottom, uh, you see sort of an artificial representation of the gradient. And then you'll see that it's more difficult to be more fine scale and specify this into different categorizations. So uh, assigning these kind of labels being so difficult, our tendency usually is to use political boundaries, but these change and they often split one population into multiple groups, which creates a lot of ambiguity as well as numerical uncertainty. So uh, for example, say we are preparing an ancestral report from a UK customer. So we want to assign some ancestry categories to this person and give some estimates of those proportions. However, a Northern Irish person can be genetically closer to an average person from Ireland than to an average UK person, say from England or Cornwall. So at the country level grouping, they would have to be included in the UK set because that's a political boundary. However, genetically, they might fall into a different group. So for precision, you might want to split the UK into major administrative regions like England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. But then where do you stop? Do you treat the Orkney Island people separately because they're genetically quite distinct from Scotland, even though they belong to the same administrative division? Or for more fine scale resolution, do you go down to the county level? Do you try to separate Yorkshire from Lancashire and make 109 groups? Really, there is no correct answer because giving hundreds of small groups in a separate report would be too much for a user to understand, probably not very interesting but also it's impossible to estimate accurately. But on the other hand, if we only gave continental groups and if we said everyone is European from Britain to France to Germany, then that would really be specific or interesting enough for consumer. So the groups that these companies tend to use are compromised and they only have limited precision. Uh, so this really is an illustration of how fine scale do you want to get? And this really is a problem of plenty because if you are at the uh, one extreme, you have too few categories. If you are on the other extreme, you have too many, and either probably is not very interesting. So, is there really a perfect way to reasonably combine the population groups into something usable where we have an interpretable number of ethnicity components as well as good precision in estimating the contribution from each? And as we probably understand by now, the answer is no. So, what do the companies really do? There is substantial variability in what they do. Uh, in the reference populations that they use to assign people into groups, the algorithms they employ, and in addition, there is some procedural variability. So the groups they assign can be very different. On the right, you can see a, a report from uh, Canada CBC. So they had two identical twins take different ancestry tests. And not only there is huge difference in the two companies, but there's also substantial difference between the identical twins, which also should not happen. So obviously there is a lot of variability in both the numbers and the interpretation. And also obviously these numbers do not really represent proportion of recent ancestors that came from each of these regions. These are just some numbers estimated from your DNA that doesn't really have a precise interpretation that we can link to ancestors. So really, Considering all of these confusing things, what does it mean to be British? So if we ask that to people, probably a lot of people would give uh, these possible answers. So it can mean genealogical heritage. So all of your ancestors have to live in Britain for a certain X number of generations. It can mean genetic identity. So you have to belong to the same group of majority British people, if that group is well defined. Or people might use some kind of legal citizenship. So you might have a British passport, you might be born in Britain, naturalized or so on. So let us know what you think, according to you, what does it mean to be white British? And of course you don't have to be white British to answer it, just uh, let us know what you think, even if you're not.
and show more let us know what people are saying yes you need to answer the next question in the uh, desmos because uh, it's question number six it's not the question number five we are seeing some responses already um so uh, a couple of responses in the genetic identity one response uh, refers to legal citizenship and there is somebody who thinks there can be some other definition of white british yes that's probably uh, something to consider that different people could have different uh, different per perspectives of what it means and what most people say might not be the perfect answer that they would choose as a definition of citizenship so what we have here is the sort of the common ways in people define but of course each person has their own understanding and they may use more than one criteria to define white british so after we have discussed what it means to be british let's play a quiz and you'll probably have to go back to the previous question because we switched the orders by mistake but here's the box model of a celebrity and if you don't know about him already uh, then please go to the desmos link make a guess because we have been talking so far about ethnicity and uh, we will talk about different ethnicities and so on so here's a quiz uh, that again you can answer regardless of your uh, british or white or not so let's look at this person uh, if you don't know about him and make a guess of a ethnicity of this person and that could be british or the european south asian east asian african middle eastern or other we are starting to see some responses well again the responses are quite well distributed among the options uh, okay, somebody that's interesting that this was somebody thinks that this, this person is british while some other person thinks that uh, this person is african and while mm -hmm. there is another response in the other segment as well okay that's interesting we are having this online so we probably can't follow up and ask all our participants why they are assigning this person into each of these ethnic groups and what is their thinking behind connecting this person's appearance to this person's ethnicity but this is something that you may think about when you're making this decision. So uh, in case you know about this person already, uh, because uh, this image was in the news a lot a few years back, this person is the very famous cheddar man. So is uh, probably the oldest British person that we have ever found in the British island. So this is a person whose uh, skeletons were discovered uh, to have lived in Britain about 10,000 years ago. So this is part of the Mesolithic uh, people who came and settled in Britain and probably were ancestors of the people who built Stonehenge. So this is really probably the earliest British person you can think of. And this person has been staying in the British island for 10,000 years. But probably, as you can see, this person would not be classified as white British these days. And you would probably think that this person looks more like African and so on. So that's why when we talk about being British and being white and so on, it's important to think about how did different things link with each other. And given the history of migrations to this island, how do we really define these things? So, uh, there was a genetic study uh, which looked at the genetic classifications of different people in Britain, and uh, they talked about how the different contributions of people from mainland Europe who came to the British islands left in our DNA. And that links to our question of the genealogical heritage. So if we define being British as all ancestors living in Britain for X number of generations, then to be precise, we have to say what would be the value of X for us. But when we try to put down a number of generations, if we go back too many years, if we go back several hundred years, then all the British people have ancestors from mainland Europe, would be Normans, Angles, Saxons, Vikings, or even Stone Age farmers like the Cheddar Man. And if we go far enough back, say tens of thousands or millions of years, then we are all descended from Africa. So 
we can't really make a distinction if we go too far back. However, if we want to keep the value of x too low, then we have ambiguity on the other direction. So for example, what about the Irish famine and all the Irish people who then came to Britain and intermingled with British people? Or was it, what about the descendant of this South Asian person who was one of the earliest South Asian person to be living in Britain during the time of Queen Victoria? So if descendants of this person have been living in Britain for more than a hundred years, would you classify this person as white British or British? Uh, so these are questions to think about when trying to define something accurately. On the other hand, instead of genealogical heritage, we may try to define that by genetic identity. And as I said, that given the history of migrants to Great Britain and all the genetic imprints they have left, is it really possible to perfectly define a uniquely British, and by British I mean Great Britain genetic group, which fully encompasses everything in this island from Cornwall to Scotland, as well as excluding everything else. So the Northern Irish and all the other Europeans like French and Viking, even though all of them have contributed their genes to the British people. And of course, uh, as you can see in this plot, uh, the, that genetic study compared the genes of British people to all these different locations in Europe and you can see a widespread imprint of the genetic contributions. So everywhere you see contributions from Scandinavia to Viking, you see contributions from Germany to Angles and Saxons, you can see contributions from France that's related to Normans and other Northern Viking descendant groups. So it's really difficult to perfectly cluster the British people separately from all their European cousins. And that's really the challenge in trying to define something precisely. And that's why I say that the answer really is no, uh, even we try to define it through genetic identity. So it's, uh, again, we can look at an analogy of these colored clusters on the right, where uh, each dot is quite intermingled with each other. But say, if you're trying to draw any lines in the graph to separate the various clusters, of course, you will never be able to separate them 100% by drawing lines because they're all intermixed. And yet this is something what we are trying to do if you're trying to define very precise genetic groups. So you might wonder why when I was asking this question, I was trying to be exclusive and say that, yeah, we want to define something that's uniquely uh, Great Britain and that's not covering Ireland, say Northern Ireland or Northern Ireland. And that's because this attempt to exclude Irish ancestry when defining British, despite all the history of intermixing, shouldn't really be surprising as historically there has always been such an exclusionary attitude. And on the right, I have an image from an anti-Irish poster that says, flag to let, but no colored and no Irish children. That's from the Irish Heritage Society. Uh, this is just a sort of a reminder of how uh, the society used to think like, and probably also an indicative of attitudes that we still see today, uh, but with other, ethnic groups. So for example, there have always been uh, this kind of exclusionary attitude to other Europeans as well, even if they were white or light skinned and in that sense more similar to white British people. And they have always been discriminated, not just in the UK, but in the US and other places, either depending on their ethnicity, such as Italian or German, here you can see a poster, but also on their religion. So whether Catholics or Jews and so on. And that's really, uh, reminding us of the video clip that we're seeing at the beginning of the anti-German sentiment during First World War, which actually led the British royal family to change their surname to something that's more British sounding. And you can think about this as uh, changing the surname and trying to be more British in a social or cultural way. But of course, that does not mean changing your ethnicity, either genetically or genealogically, which will still show an affinity to German. And again, given that uh, most British people think of the royal family as the epitome of Britishness, what does it really mean when we are trying to put a definition of being British or being white British? And these are really some uh, difficult aspects to think about. So uh, let's stop talking about ethnicity for a while and let's talk about genetic testing. That's the other part. And you might think of genetic testing as something consumer facing, but it's 
not really just that. Uh, genetic testing is really much more widespread. So it use, is used in a lot of clinical settings. So for example, uh, it's used in clinical diagnostics by NHS, uh, not just as a hobby for consumers who would probably use these kind of direct to consumer testing kits. So have you ever used genetic testing either for medical or for other reason, including the use of such DTC kits? Uh, please let us know at the Desmos poll. Well, we are already seeing some responses. And mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, none of the students have ever used genetic testing yet. What about you, Kostu? Have you ever used genetic testing? I have used genetic testing, but as a scientist, I have analyzed my DNA myself. So I haven't sent it out to any companies or uh, health institutes. But I guess that would be diff different for most of our participants if they did. What about you, Shomo? No, even me, I haven't used genetic testing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that's more likely for most uh, South Asian people. Although genetic testing is quite common in uh, primarily white European descendant countries like UK or US or Australia, less so than uh, say South Asia or Africa, for example. But it's actually quite widespread and a lot of people living in Britain might have used it because as I said, NHS routinely uses such tests, for example, during pregnancy to assess uh, the mother and the baby while still in the womb. So it does uh, screening for a lot of things, including sickle cell and thalassemia, which are inherited diseases. And uh, if uh, the mother is carrying the uh, gene that increases the risk for these diseases, then they can pass these uh, genes to their baby. So NHS offers these screening tests to see if the baby will suffer from that risk. And they give a lot of different tests. So they have this very nice explainer on their website, which tells you in which cases you would get a definite answer and in which cases you won't. And uh, therefore, they also say that if there is some uncertainty, then you would be given additional diagnostic tests to be precise. And then the parents would be given an informed choice of what they want to do if their child is suspected to have a certain risk to a certain genetic disease. So they would tell you the amount of risk and they will give you options of what you want to do. So that's really very informative and that's really how people should convey the interpretations of the genetic test that they are going through. So a very prominent example was uh, this news about Angelina Jolie a few years ago, where she did a screening for breast cancer given that a lot of her uh, ancestors, her mother, her uh, grandmother and so on, they did suffer from breast cancer. So she underwent this genetic testing and saw that she has very high risk. So this is an article from BBC, which again, nicely communicates the risk by saying 87% risk. And then after she had uh, this surgery, which is really preemptive, even before she developed cancer, she was able to decrease her risk to the level of average women, which say is about 5%. So that's, some, that's actually a nice example of using genetic testing preemptively uh, for our health needs. And this actually is said that is uh, led to an increased awareness about these kind of screenings for cancer. So that's quite good. Uh, uh, now we are going to look at another example, which is also something that is quite well known to be a, a genetic factor and that's lactose tolerance. You may know that humans have this unique ability to digest milk in adulthood, which usually most animals don't have. And it's thought that this ability evolved within recent few thousand years after our adoption of herding. So it's a nice example of recent human evolution and also of co-evolution of a biological aspect with the cultural practice. So as a result of that, many adult humans are lactose tolerant, but also many other humans are intolerant, for example, in different other parts of the world. And uh, this distinction is determined by mutations in a gene that helps us digest lactose. So that's a characteristic that we are probably quite familiar about when we go to a cafe, we can order dairy-free milk and so on. And that's perfectly normal, but there recently has been some surprising controversy around milk drinking, 
because white supremacists adopted it and made it into a ritual. But why? Because they, given these facts, they stupidly think that only white Europeans can digest milk, so it indicates their racial purity. As you saw, there is a lot of difficulty in trying to define a unique white British or white American genetic group. Uh, so they think that this simple tool of ability to drink milk is a nice indicator of racial purity. And also they think it's an indicator of their superiority because they have this special ability to digest milk. So this became really big news. Here's, for example, news from New York Times covering this and also covering why geneticists think this is really a bad idea. And part of the reason is that uh, something that these people don't know is that lactose tolerance actually also seen widespread in other parts of the world, for example, in South Asia and in Africa. So it, for example, is seen in tribes of African herders, which is sort of what you would expect given these people are also drinking milk. And here in the map, you can see that just like Europe, parts of Africa have very high ability to digest milk. And it's also interesting that the particular mutations in that gene is different between Europeans and Africans. So this ability has evolved independently in different continents. So here on the right, you can see that the specific mutations carried by Europeans are not seen in Africa, yet the ability is seen very highly in different parts of Africa. So this is really, an interesting fact, which probably these people don't know, but also probably which these people don't care about knowing, because there's this very famous quote saying that reasoning will not make someone correct a wrong opinion if they didn't acquire it by reasoning, if they just acquired it by personal bias or misunderstanding or something like that. So there has been a lot of decent discussions on how white supremacists or in general any ethnic supremacists are wrong in many different ways and what are their misunderstandings and what we can do to argue against them. So this is a small example of showing that. Uh, but this then is another example of a more general misunderstandings and personal biases about biology and genetics. And as you already saw, all these misunderstandings and biases feed into many harmful characteristics like misogyny, racism, et cetera. So let's look at this quick. Can a woman be president? The presidency is a man's job. I have women are qualified to be president. No. A female has more hormones. She could start a war in 10 seconds. If she has hot flashes, whatever, boom. Haven't all wars been started by men? Mm. And that's funny because this person is explaining, sorry, presenting a prejudice actually against their own group but this is such a strongly held personal bias that that's more prominent. So uh, on, and let's talk about general difficulties of genetic prediction, either in context of a clinical testing or context of uh, this genetic test that direct to consumer companies use. So let's look at a very hypothetical artificial example where we are studying a group of men to understand the relationship between height and blood testosterone level. So we want to build a mathematical model so that we are able to predict the height of a new person, a new consumer, based on his blood testosterone measurement. And there are three images below that represent the three different possible scenarios when we collect data to build such a model. So in the first scenario in model A, there's a very nice fit of the model and is quite useful to predict. The extreme right in model C, there's actually very little connection between the two variables and it's really difficult to construct a model which provides useful prediction. So you, if you see the R square number in the corner, uh, it represents the model's performance or its explanatory power. So a very small number, say 0.01 or 1%, means that uh, in this case, testosterone level is only explaining 1% of the variation in height. So Please go to the Desmos link and let us know how useful you think each of the models are. So from zero to 100%, say you can say it like model A would be useful for this kind of prediction, say 5% or 95% or 50%. Please let us know what you think for each of these three different models.
we are just starting to see some responses. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the students says that uh, model A is 50% useful, model B is 25% useful, model C is 50% useful. Uh, sorry, how much is for? 50 percent. Okay, that's interesting. Well, there will probably be a lot of subjectivity when trying to assign a particular number, but I guess that we'll probably see a decreasing trend that people will probably think model A to be more useful and model C to be least useful. Uh, do we see such a trend from people's responses? And not really. Uh, people are thinking that model C is the more useful one. That's interesting. Again, if it was an in-person session, we could have asked them why they think so. But in general, I would say that yeah, model C represents the least uh, strong relationship between the two variables. And in general, it has the least exponential power of just 1%. So uh, this is relevant because a few years back, we published a paper exploring the genetic basis of ear shape, and we showed how various genes affect various aspects like ear protrusion, ear lobe size, and so on, and how everything is intertwined. So that's why you use the diagram similar to the London underground map to represent this relationship. And we also mentioned that the exponential power of any particular gene is very weak, it's only about 1%. And then after a few years, I got a contact from a journalist asking uh, about a certain ancestry testing company, which was using our study and the gene we identified to predict ear protrusion of their customers. And the journalist asked me, how accurate is this prediction? Because the company in his report doesn't talk about accuracy. So how can I explain this? Only just about 1% uh, experimental power. And if they actually did say this to the consumer, would really a customer trust a prediction which is only 1% reliable. So again, that's subjective, but as a customer myself, I would probably not have a huge faith on those kind of predictions. So that leads us to the bad side of genetic testing. So often consumer testing companies would make prediction claims that are quite extravagant and flimsy. So here you see a screenshot from such a company's report. And it talks about things like mathematical ability and novelty seeking behavior, which are really extremely difficult to predict. And it's probably just wishful thinking if they say they are predicting this. But you can also try to predict other things. For example, uh, you can uh, try to predict things that are really more contested. For example, IQ, you will see a lot of companies try to predict these kind of things and then that takes into sort of, again, something into supremacy and so on. But the companies not just do that, they can do other things. For example, they can say, okay, you have, uh, say, a French or German ancestry. Why don't you go to our partners like hotels or so on and then explore your roots. So you say you buy French perfumes and so on and that way they make money. And that's really sort of their business model in that case, that they're trying to further capitalize on these kind of information but uh, this might not be really the most accurate based on what we saw. And this on the right is a nice quote from author Adam Rutherford, which says that there's sort of a build or sense of curiosity and belonging and maybe also narcissism to capitalize on these kind of things, even though they don't really make a lot of sense. So this really is indicating bad practices by genetic testing companies making claims that are extravagant and incorrect. And yet they're promoted through paid marketing, for example, through Facebook or YouTube ads. And these are luring in unsuspecting customers. For example, the lady that we saw in that video clip who often would not know the facts or even the challenges around accuracy and all the nuances. So that really, as I said, uh, is risky and is particularly risky when we are talking about things that can be really badly misinterpreted, for example, things like IQ, or in this case, milk digestion. So that would be my caveat to you, that when you talk about these things, or when you hear other people talk about these things, please think about all the nuances and all the difficulties, and don't just believe everything that goes on in the media. So that is the end of my uh, presentation. I just wanted to show you some screenshots from these kind of coverages. 
And also to remind you that PBC made an article set as something as ancestral surface are really genetic astrology. That probably gives you an idea of how unreliable they are. And thanks for attending. So I will now uh, turn on my camera back and uh, we will welcome any questions uh, through the Facebook or YouTube chat. I think we already have got a question. Um, it says, is there one DNA testing better than another or are they all better? Yeah, that's a question that often gets asked. I would say that there are a lot of genetic testing companies uh, and many of which are doing some of the things right. And there, for example, ancestry estimation, given that they are all somewhat imprecise and somewhat difficult to conduct, probably all of them, or at least most of them are sort of right at the ballpark figure. But on the other hand, many of them are trying to predict things that their customers want to listen to, for example, intelligence, but that are really not really meaningful to predict. So I don't have experience of sending my DNA to different assessor testing companies. So I wouldn't really uh, mention the name of one or the other. So that would be up to you to do some research and see what different people are saying and also whether that satisfied your needs. So for example, say if I'm South Asian and uh, this company does not have much precision about South Asian genetics, then it doesn't make much sense for me to send my DNA to them and expect good analysis results. That also depends on your ethnicity and what kind of things you want. So for example, if you want uh, to do some screening because you have family history of certain inherited diseases, that's different uh, than if you wanted to know your ancestors, whether they are from certain regions, say Scandinavia. So it's up to you to do some research about these companies and think about what you want and whether the company is able to provide that kind of results. Are there any questions? Okay, I have got another question. Uh, can you detect mental health issues in genetic testing if the parent suffers from mental health? Okay, so that's really a quite important medical consideration. And just like cancer, there are sometimes uh, important mutations that can have a clear understandable susceptibility. So for example, the NHS screens for Down syndrome, which among other things also has mental health implications. So in those cases, yes, you can detect mental health issues in genetic testing. However, there are also a lot of other ways in which mental health can be impacted in the parents, say because of environmental reasons such as upbringing. And in that case, you wouldn't see that in screening. And there are probably also other uh, factors, for example, could be genetic factors such as random mutations in the parent, which uh, just happen to arise and which the parent might have passed on to you, but this is not a known mutation that scientists have studied before. So even if you had that, even if you had genetic screening, they might not be able to say anything about it because they haven't seen it before. So. Uh, you may consider doing a screening if you know about these issues and if you can find a place which is good at making this kind of analysis. However, uh, depending on what factor you have, and whether it's genetic or environmental, you may or may not have a clear answer from the testing. So I think the second question is what made me specialize in this area? Well, yeah, I think that these uh, questions around genetics are very interesting. So it's very tangible because it connects to what we are and how we uh, interact in this world. For example, if I'm lactose intolerant, I know I am uh, based on the genetic screening that I did. So then I can do these days, uh, drink dairy-free milk, for example. So these are things that are very tangible to us and also very interpretable, even when we are talking to common people, say our relatives. So that's really my uh, interest in this area that it makes me understand more of what I am and what we are. 
Great. Uh, I've got another question. Uh, somebody is asking what would be the best way to establish lineage for someone trying to prove that they are of noble blood, for example. <laughs> I would suggest them to read this very nice book by Adam Rutherford, which really uh, talks about these kind of probability calculations, which show that almost everybody in Britain have more than 100% chance of inheriting their DNA from one of those royal families. So you can uh, say that, well, everybody in Britain has that lineage, so it's really not surprising. But also, if you wanted to establish two genealogy specifically, then that's more about historians, not genetics. Because as I said, you may be related to someone through genealogical family history, but you may not carry any DNA from them. Okay. Uh, the next question is, what is the biggest ethical dilemma uh, concerning genetic testing? I would say that a lot of ethical dilemma considering in general genetic analysis is uh, the bias uh, against, not necessarily against, but the bias away from minority ethnicities. By minority, I mean people living in the UK or US. Because a lot of times these genetic testing companies or even scientific studies, they don't have good representation for minorities. And it's not just about genetics. You may remember that, for example, when trying to unlock your phone, uh, dark-skinned people have more difficulty because the software is not built for them or built with them in mind. So the same kind of ethical considerations apply for minorities as well. So if you are trying to predict risk for minorities, Oftentimes, there is no good genetic database to build your models on. So that is one issue that, for example, the NHS and uh, a lot of the medical researchers are aware of. There's also um, issues around participation. So if, say, in the US, often uh, minority ethnic groups are being exploited to participate, and the companies are just taking their data, uh, but they're not giving them really any benefits. So there's this issue about exploitation as well that needs to be remembered when thinking about these things. I think we don't have any more questions yet. Okay, uh, thank you Shomo. Uh, thank you everyone for attending and I'll probably see you at the next British Science Week event.